every time we have finally come to recognize a profound challenge faces us, leaders emerge. I have great confidence uh, that uh, our next generation of leaders are gonna be incredible. Welcome to Work Inspired, a podcast where leaders in business, commercial real estate, technology and design come together to discuss change, challenge and opportunity in today's professional world. This show is powered by BOS, a leader in commercial interiors. The team of workplace experts at BOS is equipped and ready to help you navigate the path to your next workspace. Whether you're a seasoned leader or just starting out in your career, you're gonna learn something new today. So sit back, relax, enjoy, and get ready to work inspired. Welcome to Work Inspired, a podcast where leaders in business, commercial real estate, technology, and design come together to discuss change, challenge, and opportunity in today's professional world. This show is powered by BOS, a leader in commercial interiors. The team of workplace experts at BOS is equipped and ready to help you navigate the path to your next workspace. Whether you're a seasoned leader or just starting out in your career, you're gonna learn something new today. So sit back, relax, enjoy, and get ready to work inspired. Tom, thanks so much for being on the show. So glad you're here and so excited to talk with you today. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure, George. Tell me, who is Tom Moore? Talk about your professional experience a little bit leading up until what you're doing now. Yeah, sure. Um, well, first and foremost, I'm a husband and a dad. <laughs> <laughs> the most important roles in my life. Sure. Um, yeah, but, but I'm also a business guy, uh, and I have a lot that I do in that context. Um, uh, in, in my business vocation, I uh, came out of media. I was president of Nightbreeder Digital. Knight Ritter used to be a uh, Fortune 500 company before it was sold um, and broken up. I was on the board of, you know, cars.com, apartments.com, and career builder, some of the assets we had invested in. And after Knight Ritter uh, was sold, I started a startup and went on a six-year journey that I freely admit was the hardest journey in my life. <laughs> uh, but it was, it, was, it was great. It was very formational. And uh, out of that experience, I gained a passion for the journey of company building and began to uh, uh, a company called CEO Quest, where uh, I coach technology company CEOs. Great. So when you say you coach them, uh, these are leaders in business. What kind of things do you coach? What, what are they looking to learn when they work with CEO yeah. Quest? It's a great question. Um, the whole gamut. So what I always seek to do is to um, deeply understand the current state of the company uh, where it seeks to be, what the gap is, and uh, sort of what's the next indicated thing <laughs> that has to be attacked. And that, frankly, can be in any domain. It could be in product. It could be in people. It could be in systems. It could be in uh, uh, other aspects of the business, the revenue engine, whatever. And so I, I really just try to uh, ascertain that and then help CEOs to sort of lock in that that's the issue we got to work on. And then to uh, uh, help them with best practices as to how to attack the particular problem at hand. Very cool. So you've had, I mean, you've got a lot of experience running a Fortune 500 business, startups, you know, all these different in, you know, types of companies and different leaders that you're working with. It, it, it seems like you've had the opportunity to work with a lot of different leaders uh, in your past and in your current business. Can you tell me some kind of persistent leader qualities or traits that you've recognized that makes a leader effective? Yeah, um, for sure. So first off, as I think your question implies, there's such a diversity of, of leaders, right? You've got leaders with high EQ, other leaders have high IQ, some leaders are um, extroverted, some leaders are introverted, some are more sort of risk welcoming and others are risk averse, right? So you have such a diversity. And of course, the context that they are working in is also diverse. What stage is the company? What's the business model? What are the unit economics? What are you trying to accomplish? So obviously, there's a lot that is bespoke, right, in leadership. However, to your point, I do think there are some fundamental things. First off, great leaders, um, come, you know, uh, CEO leaders are smart. Got to be smart. In order to know 
uh, to be able to look uh, now near and far and to see the complex reality of things, um, you, you, you need that. Um, but I also think, and actually in one of my books, I guess it was The Fit Systems Enterprise, I, I wrote about that today's leaders are ethically grounded, digitally literate systems thinkers. Hmm. Wow. And there's a that, lot in that, yeah. right? Yeah. Ethically grounded, digitally literate systems thinkers. It, it, the enterprise, or any company at any stage, it's it, it, ever more true as you get larger, but even in its early nascent state, any enterprise is a system. It's a system made up of subsystems that exists in an ecosystem. And its job is to survive and then thrive, right? And, and the act of intervening as a leader in such a way as to promote the survival and the thriving of the enterprise at whatever stage you're in uh, is always uh, the thing. That is, that is what leadership is. And you've got to interact. Uh, you've got to make that happen at the intersection of people, workflows, technology, and money flows. It's at that interaction that the magic happens, right? So leaders are those who are capable, good leaders are those that are capable of bringing together people, workflows, technology, and money flows to attack the next indicated thing on the journey of company building. Mm. You brought up the, uh, the first, the first kind of uh, criteria on your list was ethically grounded. I think too, and I don't want to name any company names, but you've read the, you know, the, the, the histories of some companies and biographies of some leaders. And I think maybe the best fictional case is that is the show succession <laughs> a lot of questionable ethics there if you've ever seen it but <laughs> describe that a little bit i mean is it is it possible i mean because i've worked for some really ethical really grounded leaders and then i've also worked for some that were very much just about results and results based and and the people p piece was kind of just a tool to getting to the results and then obviously some combinations and in, in betweens but but talk about the ethics piece. Why is that important? Because we're human. <laughs> and, and therefore, it is so important um, to, it, it really what it all comes down to is what's, what's your circle of care? Okay. So at the extreme, we all know that there are leaders that we can think of in, in business and other domains whose entire circle of care uh, is, is themselves. That's all. That's it. Done. Okay. And, 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 you know, I think that a sign of maturity, of ethical maturity, is how, why, how many circles of care you expand out to, right? Like, obviously, we, we start with, you know our our relationship with God, uh, our ourselves, right? That and you know, and then our family, you know, our wife or husband or our family, and out we go. In business, of course, a leader that's in business, um, there's at least three stakeholders that are vital, right? Uh, there's our employees. Well, there's our the investor, right? They've put money into the business. Got to care about that, right? There is the uh, employee, and there's the customer. And then there are partners and, and so forth. All of these stakeholders have a right to be treated with certain basic decency, with respect, uh, uh, it, it, with encouragement, with support, um, and so forth. And I think what we see in great leaders are people, ethically grounded leaders, are people who are sensitive to the needs of people in various circles of care that may not immediately benefit them directly, right? They don't do it for that reason. They do it because it's the right thing to do. And, and an ethical leader is, is, is conscious of that. They're, they're asking themselves, what is the right thing to do? So, and, and by the way, it's always messy. It's never perfect, right? There's always competing needs and interests. It's not like Anyone gets it perfect, but the ethical leader tries to. They don't succeed, but they try. Yeah, especially interesting those times when you talk about those those circles of care, 
com, you know, where their interests conflict with one another. And we hear about those in business quite, quite often. So very interesting. You also mentioned the digital, digitally literate, I think you said, and, and especially here in the Midwest, but I think around the world, a lot of times we look to some of the innovation that's happening on the West Coast, where I think some of your clients run businesses, the tech companies, for what's coming as far as it relates to digital and uh, and the future of technology and how it will impact our industries. So talk about that a little bit. How Why is digital literacy more important yeah. today than ever before? Well, uh, I would argue that we now live in a world in which every company in the world is a technology company. They may not know it yet, <laughs> but if they're going to exist and survive, they, they have to be a technology company. Now, I, I use the term broadly, okay? So uh, you can be a technology company that is very effectively leveraging technology built by others, right? That's okay. Um, that can be the right thing for certain types of businesses. and or. Uh, and it's usually and, uh, there are certain types of technology that can only be built by you, right? Because it's unique to what you're doing. And, and so, um, uh, and the reason that is so important is that uh, technology built poorly uh, creates a rigidity inside your company that you can almost not fix. Once it's screwed up, it's very, very hard to fix. Um, that is especially true of technology that is built by you but it can also be true of technology that you bring in. CRM systems and marketing automation systems can get all screwed up. If you don't enter the data in properly, if you don't manage the controls over how things get done, right? Uh, so a digitally literate leader is conscious of these things and they work very hard to elevate the quality of their systems inside the business, uh, which by the way, when I use the word systems or subsystems inside a business, I mean it in the socio-technical sense that it's not just the tech, it's also how the people interact with the tech, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? It's yep. a socio-technical thing to solve. So anyway, yeah, that's what I mean by digitally literate. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. We're constantly preaching the concept of digital advocacy, mostly for, that, for what you just said. It's, it's, it's not enough just to have the technology in place or the marketing systems in place or the brand messaging, right? You need your people to also be able to leverage it, utilize it, spread it, really. So I, I completely yeah. agree. Yeah. You talked about a book of yours. Now, you've authored five books, as, a, as I understand it, which is remarkable. Uh, congratulations. Tell me a, a, a little bit about the books and about your experience as an author. Yeah. Well, you know, when I started CEO Quest, I had just come out of my own experience as a tech company CEO. Uh, and the thing that was fascinating is that I had, uh, you know, when I started my startup, I, I was further along in my career than many people in, in startups. And I, I felt like I was a fairly, you know, oh, I don't want to go overboard, but a relatively accomplished leader that I knew what I was doing, right? I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> I got started in my startup. And there were all kinds of problems early on that I had never encountered before because all the companies I worked for already had accomplished their value breakthrough. They mm. had a product that was working, okay? I didn't. <laughs> and so the journey of sorting all that out and, and, you know, was fascinatingly complex for me at the time. And, you know, of course, as you go along, you do learn things. But when I decided I wanted to coach, I made a fundamental decision. I, I said, I'm not going to be one of these coaches who simply sucks from the straw of my own personal experience. Okay. That's helpful. It's important, but it's not sufficient. I wanted to go at this very rigorously. And so I sat down in the summer before I started actually coaching, after I left my startup and was beginning to prepare to do this. And I sort of sorted out that in my view, there are five major domains of company building, right? That exist. You've got, you've got people, you've got product, you've got the revenue engine, you've got systems, and you've got what I call belief, which as you were referencing before, 
is the belief of our employees, our customers, and our investors. And when I sort of figured out those five domains, I said, you know, I need to write a book about each of these. And I, I had this sort of naive idea that I would write five books on each of these domains. Little did I know that it would take me about 8,000 hours to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I did. So, I, yeah, the books are uh, People Design, The Four-Way Fit, which is just recently released on Amazon here, um, uh, which is about product. Scaling the Revenue Engine, which is uh, another one on Amazon, uh, the Fit Systems Enterprise, and, and, and Funding and Exits, which is about the belief of the investor. So, and it was good. It, it led to me getting more rigorous about things. And as I coached, I was able to bring that rigor, but also as I coach, I learn, and that helps me write better. So it's sort of this nice virtuous cycle. Yeah, I love it. Taking kind of the, your awareness and the exposure you've got to many different companies and kind of compiling that. It's almost like research, right? 8,000 hours though. You said 8,000? Is that what you said? Wow. Yeah. It's a lot of time. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it was it, writing for the last eight years has been almost half my time. Yeah. It's, it's been a significant commitment uh, to, to, but it's, but it's also been Great. Like I'm, I'm, I'm so happy they're done <laughs> that they are written as opposed to to be written. Uh, but it, it, I've now been freed up in, in some good ways. And there's new things that have come along that have uh, now filled up that time in a good way. So, well, we'll talk about some of those in a minute. I, I, I definitely think it's, it's remarkable to have a volume. I don't know what else you would call it of novels that you or or of uh, books that you've written to kind of say, you know, these are tangible things that, that you, you can put on your shelf and be proud of compared to some of the, the new stuff that you're doing, which is very different, but also maybe just as effective at gaining attention as a book is. So we'll talk about that in a second. But before we do, our company deals with space. Uh, we're, wow. you know, our, our, our business is creating workspaces and helping organizations achieve high-performing spaces so that their teams can be effective. Obviously, with the pandemic and remote work, that's kind of changing. And the idea of hybrid working is, has evolved and I think is here to stay. I'm interested from your perspective, talking to all these different business leaders, how are they thinking about space, especially the future of work as it relates to space? You know, it's fascinating. And, and you are right at the epicenter of one of the most important changes in the world right now, what you mm -hmm. guys are doing, right? And, and mm -hmm. I, there, a lot of the things I'm about to say are things you already know, but <laughs> But they really are important. Mm -hmm. um, what I notice is the leaders that I work with, I currently coach 10 uh, CEOs uh, of various stages, including a couple that are on the IPO path right now, mm -hmm. uh, is that uh, it's been a major preoccupation. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've noticed a, 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 a very tangible shift, fundamental shift in the entire way CEOs are looking at this. Mm -hmm. They used to look at space requirements and how people fit where they went as a one-sided question. What does my company need? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're now in a world where there's a balance. It's a two-sided question. It's a balance between the employer and the employee. So that's mm -hmm. the first important thing, I think. Um, the, the second thing is be because of uh, the emergence of remote uh, communications technologies like Zoom and so forth, uh, the, the, the capacity for very high quality work to be done um, in remote locations has now been proven. COVID took what was a theory at the edges and brought it to the center, a, a, a must do that had to be done this way. And it was this grand, massive experiment. And the experiment was successful. Remote work can work, can be done, and it can and it can be done well. Having said that, I think that CEOs are conscious of the fact that only remote work, without any opportunities to engage physically with people, begins to degrade culture. Mm -hmm. Right? There's risks to the culture. So, what we have is, I think, uh, CEOs getting much more smart about what's the role. What interactions are required inside the work that has to get done? What are my cultural objectives? What are the physical and logistical requirements of the work that gets done? 
And that's creating a continuum from, you know, solitary at-home work to collaborative at-home work to temporary small group physical collaboration to permanent physical collaboration, whether it be inside a factory, a satellite office, or a headquarters. Mm-hmm. And along that continuum, there it's not it, – it's um, – some aspects of it are fairly stable, and a lot is not stable. Things that are temporarily small group physical can go back to collaborative, and there can be this sort of, um, you know, uh, movement back and forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, the effect then is, in terms of space, I think what, what uh, CEOs are recognizing is, I need a space strategy that incorporates my capacity to access flexible space much more easily than I used to. Right. And then as a to permanent space, we still need some. We need less than we used to. And we want to have it on shorter lease terms than we used to. Mm-hmm. So there's more flexibility to go up and down as required versus how we used to be with the 10-year fixed lease for multiple stories in a building. Definitely. Yeah, that, that's what we're seeing that too. The culture thing is a big deal. Um, I think some of the mental fatigue that's happened and it's, it, we're trying to sort out right now, whether it's pandemic related or being remote and being isolated, but there's certainly in-person benefits. And so the way that, you know, I, we're talking to people about leveraging their spaces to be agile, to be flexible, to meet the changing needs of their teams. It's, it can be a tricky equation though, because, you know, you think of the idea of hybrid if that you're in the office two, three days a week only, part of the benefit of the office is bringing people together, right? So if only 25% of the team is in, you lose some of the benefit because the rest is still remote. So balancing what is in-person and remote and the bridge between the two of them, how do you best connect them? I think is going to be a lot of opportunity there and probably some innovation no, no, here. Yeah. I think your point, um, uh, it is, is, I think it's very important It's going to be very important as we move, hopefully fairly soon, into the endemic phase of all this, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, To bring people physically back together, okay? So whether that looks like that the entire company can be hybrid, but, you know, for certain people in the company, every Wednesday, we're all together, okay, Mm -hmm. physically, or whether it be that once a month, every first Friday, every single employee must have, must come into the office and we spend the day together. There, we need those things to keep connected, you right. know, as humans. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and you're a guy that runs a, a company that coaches, right? I think learning development is is probably in your DNA. You know, you're you're teaching leaders, so maybe it's a little bit different because it's a little bit more one-to-one, but even think of mentor mentoree or career development, professional development, starting off as a new employee at an organization and thinking about the ladder or your career path. I think some of these things might, I mean, there's opportunity to improve upon them in the remote world, but I think uh, my experience when I worked remotely for five, five or six years earlier in my career was it did feel, it felt, it felt good to be able to go work out in the middle of the day and then make my own schedule and have the flexibility and the choice that I wanted but the relationships were lacking a little bit, the network building and kind of some of those, the things that really happen serendipitously sometimes in an in-person world where you're surrounded by people, I think I was missing. So it'd be interesting to see as we move out of the pandemic and hopefully, like you said, into the endemic, how some of those needs are addressed. Um, But uh, I want to talk a little bit about something that you're doing for future leaders. Just kind of alluded to it a little bit. Uh, but this rising leaders series that you've started, uh, I don't know if you would call it on the side or in, in conjunction with CEO quest, but very interesting idea. Talk, talk a little bit about it and what you hope to achieve with it. Yeah. So, uh, I guess best entered into this by, by way of a story. I, uh, I've always been attentive to the world around me, just this is the name, you know, I was a poli sci undergrad and I've always been fascinated by um, world events and, and this kind of thing. Um, and, and yet, as you say, you know, my whole life has been focused on business and business leadership and the issue of leadership. What constitutes a good leader? How do you lead effectively in this kind of thing? And, uh, you know, candidly, um, I... Uh, encountered the events of January 6th uh, 
deeply troubled. It was very upsetting to me. And the thing that, that hit me more than anything was what a terrible failure of leadership it was that we Americans found ourselves in, in such a situation. And it, it struck me that at the heart of the whole problem is a long period of time where we simply haven't had the leadership that our country deserves, right? And as I began to ponder that one, I thought about other contexts and began to realize, you know, boy, you know, the planet, our geopolitics, here we are, Ukraine situation right now, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, all the way into our houses of worship and the issues that so many denominations have had. And everywhere you look, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with failures of leadership. Mm -hmm. And so that led me down a path where I essentially said, okay, we are, you know, I'm a boomer. Okay. I'm, I'm about ready to pass from the scene here as, as a relevant actor in this whole deal. Right. And, and the folks that really matter are the upcoming generations, the millennials and, and uh, whatever it is, the one after that, uh, Gen, Gen Z or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. And so I, I felt this, this need to, to communicate with them. And as I began to think about it, I, I felt like at the heart of the problem is not just the issue of leadership per se and the technical capabilities to get things done. But as I mentioned earlier, the ethical state of leaders. This is important. And, and that's where it began to get interesting. It, 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 I'll, 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 I'll give you that lead in right there. That's when mm -hmm. it began to get interesting. Mm -hmm. so, so tell me then, I mean, the, 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 it's kind of a, a program that you're putting together that is aimed at enabling leaders of tomorrow. And is that the goal? Yeah. And, and what are some yeah, of the so, ways that you're planning to do that? Yeah. So, so here's, here's sort of where it went for me. What mm -hmm. I began to recognize, forgive me, I'm going to go on a little bit of a digression, but I'll get right back. I'll, I'll <laughs> no be efficient. Problem. Okay. Sure. So think about this. Y you and I, George, we're humans, right? Mm -hmm. And we and our fellow humans have been around for a couple hundred thousand years, right? Mm -hmm. True fact. Yep. Okay. And I am here to theorize that the mix of virtue and vice that we humans have had has probably been pretty consistent over the course of that 200,000 years, right? Mm -hmm. There's goodness and there's badness in probably to a certain degree in all of us. And certainly mm -hmm. there's virtue and vice in, in the world. There always has been. So okay. that hasn't changed, but something has changed. Over the past two, 300 years, the, the power of our inventions has changed, okay? So through the introduction of the scientific method and the innovations that have occurred, starting with the Industrial Revolution and the creation of coal-fired steam-powered engines and the internal combustion engine, car for every household, and our modern medicine and our digital economy with its AI and social media, all creating these incredible benefits for humankind, right? Mm -hmm. Incredible mm -hmm. benefits and powerful, powerful tools, right? But along with those have come the social media echo chambers, the atom bomb, mm -hmm. you know, all these other things that are equally powerful, but now are not used for good. They're used for bad, for evil in some cases, right? And so virtue and vice in the human condition has been roughly the same, but the tools available to leaders. And so we're in a world now where our planet's in crisis, American democracy's in crisis in no small part due to the state of social media. Um, other uh, uh, geopolitical things are, are in a challenging state. And so what it occurred to me is I can't just reach out, and I wanted to reach out to the next generation of leaders to offer mm -hmm. my encouragement, support, challenge, uh, and, and, and guidance to whatever degree I could. And I recognized I couldn't do that without confronting the question of the ethical state of leaders. And for me, I'm a Christian, okay? I come to that. I believe goodness comes from God. Mm. And so I had to stand at the precipice 
and ask myself, am I willing to put myself out there and begin to do the link that nobody's supposed to do, which is to link my faith life with my work life and with the whole thing of what leadership is. Mm -hmm. And I finally decided, George, to heck with it. I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I started the Rising Leader Series. It's a weekly letter to rising leaders. It comes out every Friday. Uh, I'm sending it via email. I post it on LinkedIn. I have it on um, uh, Medium. And I even have, I was talked into this. It wasn't my idea. Uh, I even am posting videos now on TikTok uh, <laughs> and all seeking to uh, connect and and the, the, the content has a flow to it. The first quarter is who is God. The second quarter is who am I. The third quarter is where's the need. And the fourth quarter is what's my call. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a mixture of letters, uh, poems, and songs. <laughs> I, I, I'm a musician as well, uh, that, that are seeking to catch the attention of hopefully as many uh, rising leaders as possible and encouraging them to ponder whether they feel called to step into roles of leadership, not just in business, but in diplomacy, in advancing sustainability, in science, and all the other areas, in 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 um, uh, you know being an author, all of those things, uh, but doing so from a position, from a posture of advancing the goodness in the world that that is so desperately needed to get us out of the fix we're in. It's. It's very interesting. First of all, I heard you say, I think the Spider-Man quote, great, great power is great responsibility. And that's what leaders of tomorrow and the near tomorrow are facing, right? A lot more power, a lot more powerful issues, and therefore a lot more responsibility to look after mankind and the planet, right? So uh, I think the timing is needed. Um, I think that there's a big... Uh, there's a there's 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 going to be a big onus on the new generation of leaders to keep things moving forward. I guess to not be too too grim about it, but but I I do also think what you talked about with the faith piece of it is very interesting. We've had sixty sixty or so episodes of this show now. It's the first time we've talked about faith. You're right. It's something that you don't talk about in the workplace very often. Uh, same thing with politics. Same thing with you know some of these sensitive issues. We try not to offend anybody or or create any sort of tension with with the way that we communicate. I spent some of my career working in in the the Christian world with ministries, and I I know it well. Um, I mean, the interesting thing is that there's a large audience there, and all not all of them, but many of them have careers, right? So there's a big pool of future leaders that are going to come out of that that group of people. Have you been met with any sort of resistance based off of what you're doing? I know you're coaching ten CEOs. I'm not sure if they're all Christians themselves, or as you become more vocal, and I definitely want to talk about what you're doing on TikTok in a minute here. But uh, yeah. but ha, yeah, but no, what's been uh, what's been uh, the reaction? So first off, I had to sort that whole issue through myself, and the, mm -hmm. and the first thing, you know, first do no harm, right? Like uh, we live in a pluralistic world, and that is a good thing. Okay, let's mm -hmm. start there, mm -hmm. right? Uh, goodness, you know, Christians don't get to monopolize the path to goodness, okay? right? Goodness right. is in every human heart, and the circumstances of my life led me to become a Christian. Mm -hmm. There's people I know uh, who, uh, one, of, one of the CEOs I coach, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me uh, mentioning his name, is Ashik Ahmed. Uh, Ashik, mm -hmm. Ashik is uh, based in Australia, runs a phenomenal company called Deputy. He and I have wonderful conversations of faith, and his faith and mine are different. Mm -hmm. But what we share I actually think the more interesting split, if you're going to sort of split the world up, right, is not what, you know, faith tradition or belief tradition do you happen to follow, so much as it is depth versus shallowness, okay? Mm -hmm. So many of us just skim on the surface. And by the way, that includes a very significant percentage of Christians, okay, mm -hmm. who really mm -hmm. don't go deep, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the mistake is. You know, when we, when we venture into fundamental questions of the health of our soul and, mm -hmm. and how right are we with our God, however we define God. Uh, we're, we're in a good place because we're allowing ourselves to sort out, you know, what are the patterns where I am failing to live a good life, where I mm -hmm. am pursuing something that is not of God. 
And once we confront those things, we can uh, we, we can sort them out, get, get what I call our soul tangles untangled. And mm-hmm. that allows us to be freed up to act with goodness, to have a, a, a wider circle of care, to begin to be less oriented about ourselves and more oriented to others. When I started this series in my family, uh, all families have lots of diversity in them. Mine, mine certainly does. Uh, my beloved sister, who does not believe in God, um, and I, I really wanted her help. I said, you know, I'm going to be writing this, and I, I want to write it in a tone that speaks my truth, but in a way that is not offensive. Mm-hmm. Will you help me? And she was so helpful. She gave me great insights. And what I've learned in all this is that I think we need to celebrate those types of conversations in which you speak your truth, I listen with respect, and I speak my truth. Mm -hmm. In that dialogue, we're both going to grow. We're both going to sharpen our thinking and and deepen our understanding of the issues at hand or how we see our God and and, and so forth. And and that's what I've tried to do here is, is both to say, here's what I believe is a is the path towards a good towards goodness that I follow? I put it forward for you. Uh, you, I, I'm a hundred percent supportive of you picking that path up and following it yourself. But I also respect you if, in good conscience, you feel that some other path to goodness is is right for you. Mm. And, and so I've tried to sort of bring that spirit to it. And frankly. I've heard from a lot of people who are not Christian that are very thankful that I'm doing this. Yeah, I like how you described that and laid that out. I think if we tie this back to the earlier piece about the foundation of ethics or the ethical foundation, I think that it's a conversation that has to happen, right? Because that's what you're trying to teach and to build upon or to try to open the door to. And I think maybe some of the digital acumen might be out of your control in 10 to 15, 20 years, you know, as as the new generation kind of takes over and, and has to, has to uh, maintain a a knowledge and an acumen of that. But the ethics, if that's at the foundation, I think that that's going to be, that will continue to bear fruit throughout the entirety of their leadership, you know, experience and hopefully be passed on to the next generation after that. So I think what you're doing is a great thing. Uh, the message is great. I've, I've read some of your pieces. Let's talk a little bit about how you're getting the message out. You alluded to it, but now in addition to writing five novels, do you, are they called novels when they're, when they're yeah. business books? Yeah. Uh, uh, in, in uh, books. Just books. Business okay. Books, yeah. yeah. In addition to the five business books, you just got done recording in a recording studio as a musician. Tell me a little bit about that, because I think you, you just got back from. Oh, yeah. That, that was, was so fun. But before we do, let me quickly mention one thing. Sure. Um, uh, uh, the, this thing that I'm doing, that the work that, that I'm doing, I believe is extraordinarily important for this reason. You know, we need to be, I think, to strike a very important balance between being clear eyed about the severity of the challenges we face in these domains of planet, democracy, geopolitics and, and houses of worship challenges and other things. But we also have to have hope and mm-hmm. optimism, right? Now, the thing is, if all you do is look at the problems and say, oh, it's an inevitable disaster, everybody gives up. You say, eh, I'm not going to do a thing about it. Mm-hmm. It would be like Franklin Delano Roosevelt saying, today, in a day that will live in infamy, we were attacked by Japan in Pearl Harbor, and we're not going to do a thing about it. Yeah, right. Exactly. Right. We don't do that. We rise to the challenge, right? Previous generations think about our, you know, my uh, father's generation, uh, your probably grandfather's generation rose to the call at the cost of 75 million lives Mm -hmm. to save freedom around the world. Mm -hmm. There was an epic call and they responded. And I, we are too complacent. We are being challenged to say we are living in a day of infamy. Rise up, 
Get in the game. It, the, the moment is now. And so I, I, I don't want to get on to this other aspects without giving my moment of impassioned plea mm. for us to really step back and recognize how incredibly important this is. We're in a moment that matters. I believe this next generation, those leaders, many of them will need to devote their entire productive lives, 40 years, in order to turn the tide on things like the planet and some of these, which we can do. It, we will do. We can do this. But it will take leaders who sacrifice pretty much their entire lives towards the effort. And so I, I just want to get across that importance. And that's why I'm doing it. So all the details of how I do it, which I'm happy to talk about, sort of fun, uh, I, I never want to lose sight of why. No, I'm glad you took us back there. I mean, you mentioned World War II and Pearl Harbor. I mean, we just went through the pandemic, which came on very, very quickly. And you saw the scientific community rise up and create vaccines, although they are politicized and, you know, you got differing opinions on it. I think the challenge that, that, that we face often, you talk about climate change and the impact on our world, and then you get into geopolitical things, but it's you got to do both at the same time. You got to you got to ring that alarm bell and say there is a problem here. Wake up. And half the people agree with you and half the people are like that. No, no, not a problem. And then at the same time, you got to on the other side say, but there's hope <laughs> You know, like we can do this. And so when you say that, you got the people that are like, that's not really a problem saying, see, it's not a problem. So it's yeah. like this weird balance. that, And, and I'm, it, 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 we're lucky that there's people that are as passionate about you to to doing both at the same time and getting setting the stage for that work that you just described in the entire productive career of the next generation that's a lot of work that has to happen and so i think we need more of what you're doing we need more people out there there, yeah yeah they will be there we can see what you know abraham lincoln indira Mm. gandhi well Mm. gandhi for that matter uh (laughs) and on we go you know martin luther king every time we have finally come to recognize a profound challenge faces us leaders emerge Mm. and all i'm trying to do is to encourage them give them a little bit of input as to how to think about their own sort of self-development to get ready for that uh but but i have i have great confidence uh that our next generation of leaders are going to be incredible they're going to get us out of this well i applaud what you're doing and who knows? Hopefully there's a, one of those future leaders listening right now to this and will hopefully be inspired by what you just said. So thank you for, for saying it. All right, now let's talk about TikTok. <laughs> like, or talk about your recording. Uh, so, tell me, so tell me what it was like to record, what, 12 songs in a recording studio? You just finished well, off? Uh, four the- most recently, but yes, we're now up to 12. So I wanted to write a, a song for every uh, month of the year. And uh, here we are. Uh, so the, the January song, uh, every shining star is now on Spotify. The February song is on Spotify. March one, we launch uh, that one's called footsteps. Uh, March one, we launch a song called I love you more, uh, which is about Jesus. Um, and, uh, and on it goes throughout the year. So I had four left to do. And, uh, the good news is, uh, in, I, I have been so fortunate, blessed in this process uh, to have people emerge that happen to be in my circle of relationships who have been so generous to help. One of whom, uh, my sister's uh, daughter's husband, so my nephew-in-law, uh, Sean Russell, it, it ha- has a, re- uh, a recording, uh, sorry, a, a record label uh, mm-hmm. that he manages in Canada. He's, he's supporting Her- Hermitage Green and uh, some of the other uh, really tier one artists uh, today, uh, folks that are getting on the billboard charts and have gone to the Grammys and so forth. So he's very wow. good. And um, he has been more than generous in uh, helping me, you know, take these songs and get them onto Spotify and so forth. He was the one that said to me, well, you know, if you want to reach that audience, uh, you've got to get on TikTok. <laughs> and I said, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And uh, so we 
I argued with him for months leading up to the start of the year when everything began to happen, right? So everything's from this year, January 1 to the December 31st of, of 2022. And so finally, he wore me down. And with great trepidation, I stood in front of a video camera, shot the first video. And now I'm, uh, and these are one minute videos, right? So now I'm doing a, a one minute portion of that month's song every Monday. Uh, I read the poem, which is always associated with my letters on Wednesday. And every Friday, I do a reflection on that week's letter, all of which has to be within a minute. Mm. And uh, they're now coming out Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And oh my gosh, I, I've been absolutely shocked. You know, one of the reflections got 62,000 people watching it. And wow. uh, many of them are sort of in the 15 to 20 range. So, um, not, you know, I try to let go of how wide it's going to go. That's his job. You know, my mm-hmm. job is to get the content right uh, and to do practical things to advance the distribution as best I can. But yeah, no, I'm loving it. And uh, it was certainly a great thing to get those uh, last four songs uh, completed. I, I'm really happy with them, too. I, I'm sort of excited to uh, let them begin to roll out. That's very cool. Since we had our planning call a few weeks ago, I been spending a little bit more time on TikTok. Still trying to figure out a way to tie it into our industry or what we do, but it's definitely an interesting platform. And I think you're doing the right thing. You're you're diversifying the vehicles through which you deliver your message. And I think that you'll be effective that way because you know different people uh, digest content in different ways, right? So uh, any advice that you can give to leaders that are ex- thinking about exploring some maybe means it to to deliver their message and their communication that they're they haven't in the past or that maybe they're not comfortable with well look what you're doing i, I mean i i've been very impressed by you um oh, you know you. You, you are uh have have taken the space you're in the you know and and uh created a much um bigger content vessel that allows you to bring in the entire question of what is leadership and you know, how do we organize teams and so forth? And sure, it touches on the aspect of space, which is the part that, that from a direct business side, mm-hmm. uh, you're, you're referencing, but, but it allows you to have these broader conversations. And uh, I think that that's brilliant. And so uh, my tip would be for everyone to follow what you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your way. I, don't know. I don't know about that. But I do think, though, that in addition to people hearing your message, one of the opportunities when you do things like this is you get to find new ways to make relationships and connections with people that you might not otherwise have done so with. So I think that that's, I don't even, wouldn't even call it a side benefit. I think it's the benefit. And then the content and the, the distribution is, the, is, 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 also, is also very nice. So um, very excited to follow you in, in some of these various ways. Check out your books. I'm going to listen to some of your Spotify stuff on the way home today. Um, look for you on TikTok, but uh, tell me, I just a couple personal questions to finish us off here. Tell me one thing that you're looking forward to in the next 12 months. You know, it's interesting. I, um, I received a nice note from that sister I was telling you about who mm-hmm. had read my most recent post and, and she made a comment along the lines of, it's amazing that this late in life, I'm still learning new things about my brother. It was so cool to read. You know? <laughs> That's cool. She yeah. asked, uh, how do you feel about where you are now? You know, are, are you at, you know, the beginning of something new at the ending? And, and I, I wrote back and I said, I feel like I'm at an ending, a beginning and a middle, all mm. of the above. And I have no clue. I really don't. It's one of the most fascinating questions I'm now pondering is where's this all leading? And I really, I, George, I, I just don't know. I don't know where it's leading. All I know is I am feeling that I am doing what God's called me to do right now. You know, not perfectly, but at least as best I can. So that's good enough for now. We'll see where it goes. I was going to say, it sounds to me like you've got someone you trust steering the ship. So I think you're (laughs) in a good place. Tell me if you were going to, you know, you said you're... I don't know. I don't remember how you put it, but let's say you were retiring tomorrow and, 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 and maybe focus on the CEO quest. Cause I don't think there's any chance you're retiring from, uh, from what you're doing with the, the rising leader series, but what, what's a word of advice that you would leave behind? What's some wisdom that you would leave to a successor? 
I think if there's one thing that I have come to greatly appreciate, uh, especially in the last 10 years of my, of my work life, um, it is the enormous capacity of human beings to accomplish things if they put their mind to it. Mm. Right. And the, the thing that, that, that constrains so many people is their lack of self-belief that they can do it. Mm. And so my encouragement to everyone, certainly rising leaders, young rising leaders stepping into their first leadership roles is, you know, don't doubt yourself, as my grandmother once told me. Don't doubt yourself. It, it, have it, Live your life fully. Test the boundaries. You know, it, it, you got to do the work. Like if you have aspirations to accomplish, you know, a triple axle, it's not going to happen unless you do your workouts, right? right. You got to do the work. But if you have the passion that you feel uh, to, the, to, to get something done, to meet the problems of our time or whatever, have confidence you can make a difference and get in there and do the work because mm. it's true. You can accomplish incredible things. So uh, don't, don't self-limit. I guess that would be the biggest advice. Don't self-limit. You are incredible. Go for it. I love that. That's great advice. If someone wants to learn more about the Rising Leader series, where, where, can, they, where can they go? Yeah, so uh, all my letters are on tommore.com. That's M-O-H-R, Tom, M-O-H-R.com. Uh, they're all there. The songs are on, uh, they're rolling out on Spotify. And if you want to hear one early, you got to email me and I'll, uh, yeah, I'll send you an MP3 file. <laughs> but, the, <laughs> but they'll come in the normal course uh, at the beginning of every month. And they just search for your name on Spotify? Yes, just Tom Moore, M-O-H-R. Gotcha. And one last question, Tom. If there was a a resource that you could recommend that has been helpful to you in your career, what would it be? Hmm. Hmm. Um, So it's funny because there's just, I'm almost, you know, gobsmacked because I, I, there's so many different things I could say. I think that 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 the 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 resource is your relationships. Mm. You know, find the mentor. You know, uh, learn from those who have gone before. Uh, be a sponge, mm. <laughs> and and um, you know, I think if you if you can do that, uh, there's obviously incredible books. I could give you a list of great books to read, but. The, the biggest thing is, is when you find your passion, find those that are also passionate and those that have gone before you and learn like crazy. That, that's mm-hmm. the best way to grow. Well, we'll put a list of five great books to look up on the show notes of this episode, all written by yourself. Um, but I, that's, great. that's great advice. I, we've heard it before on this show. Find mentors, ask for help. People are willing to give and uh, sometimes you just got to ask and be ready to receive. So appreciate everything that you've shared with us today, Tom. Very inspirational. Um, it's exactly why we started this show. Um, good luck with everything you've got ahead of you. And we'll be excited to follow what you're doing and be the sponges as you share your wisdom with us. Well, thanks, George. And, and thank you for what you're doing. It's, it's very impressive. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, please take a moment to rate our show. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the Work Inspired Podcast so that you don't miss any of the incredible guests we have planned for upcoming episodes. We'll continue to find the best and brightest minds in business so that you can learn, grow, and succeed, and so that we can all work inspired. Work Inspired is brought to you by BOS, a leader in commercial working environments and a Hayworth best-in-class dealership. Experience our 360 approach and discover the team, tools, and techniques required to navigate the complexity of your next workspace at BOS.com. If you have ideas, feedback, or would like to be featured on our show, please email podcast at BOS.com. Thank you for listening. This has been a Workspace Digital production. If you're interested in launching a podcast at your organization, please email info at workspace.digital 
for a free consultation.